Welcome to the 3ABN Australia Radio Book Reading Program. The Desire of Ages, written by Ellen White, is an inspirational account of the life and ministry of Jesus. What you are about to hear is a dramatized audio version of this book, created by Nancy Hamilton Myers. To download your free copy, visit the Desire of Ages Project. Com. Listen now as Nancy continues to read from The Desire of Ages. The Desire of Ages, Chapter 18 He Must Increase For a time, the Baptist's influence over the nation had been greater than that of its rulers, priests, or princes. If he had announced himself as the Messiah and raised a revolt against Rome, Priests and people would have flocked to his standard. Every consideration that appeals to the ambition of the world's conquerors, Satan had stood ready to urge upon John the Baptist. But with the evidence before him of his power, he had steadfastly refused the splendid bribe. The attention which was fixed upon him, he had directed to another now he saw the tide of popularity turning away from himself to the Savior. Day by day, the crowds about him lessened. When Jesus came from Jerusalem to the region about Jordan, the people flocked to hear him. The number of his disciples increased daily. Many came for baptism, and while Christ himself did not baptize, He sanctioned the administration of the ordinance by his disciples. Thus he set his seal upon the mission of his forerunner. But the disciples of John looked with jealousy upon the growing popularity of Jesus. They stood ready to criticize his work, and it was not long before they found occasion. A question arose between them and the Jews as to whether baptism availed to cleanse the soul from sin. They maintained that the baptism of Jesus differed essentially from that of John. Soon they were in dispute with Christ's disciples in regard to the form of words proper to use at baptism, and finally as to the right of the latter to baptize at all. The disciples of John came to him with their grievances, saying, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. Through these words, Satan brought temptation upon John. Though John's mission seemed about to close, it was still possible for him to hinder the work of Christ. If he had sympathized with himself and expressed grief or disappointment at being superseded, he would have sown the seeds of dissension, would have encouraged envy and jealousy, and would seriously have impeded the progress of the gospel. John had by nature the faults and weaknesses common to humanity, But the touch of divine love had transformed him. He dwelt in an atmosphere uncontaminated with selfishness and ambition and far above the miasma of jealousy. He manifested no sympathy with the disaffection of his disciples, but showed how clearly he understood his relation to the Messiah and how gladly He welcomed the one for whom he had prepared the way. He said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. John represented himself as the friend who acted as a messenger between the betrothed parties, preparing the way for the marriage. When the bridegroom had received his bride, 
the mission of the friend was fulfilled. He rejoiced in the happiness of those whose union he had promoted. So John had been called to direct the people to Jesus, and it was his joy to witness the success of the Savior's work. He said, This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Looking in faith to the Redeemer, John had risen to the height of self-abnegation. He sought not to attract men to himself, but to lift their thoughts higher and still higher until they should rest upon the Lamb of God. He himself had been only a, a voice, a cry in the wilderness. Now with joy he accepted silence and obscurity, that the eyes of all might be turned to the light of life. Those who are true to their calling as messengers for God will not seek honor for themselves. Love for self will be swallowed up in love for Christ. No rivalry will mar the precious cause of the gospel. They will recognize that it is their work to proclaim, as did John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. They will lift up Jesus, and with him humanity will be lifted up. Thus saith the High and Lofty One that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is Holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. The soul of the prophet, emptied of self, was filled with the light of the divine. As he witnessed to the Saviour's glory, his words were almost a counterpart of those that Christ himself had spoken in his interview with Nicodemus. John said, He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the spirit of measure unto him. Christ could say, I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. To him it is declared, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. The Father giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. So with the followers of Christ, we can receive of heaven's light only as we are willing to be emptied of self. We cannot discern the character of God or accept Christ by faith unless we consent to the bringing into captivity of every thought to the obedience of Christ. To all who do this, the Holy Spirit is given without measure. In Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and in him ye are made full. The disciples of John had declared that all men were coming to Christ, but with clearer insight John said, No man receiveth his witness. So few were ready to accept him as the Savior from sin. But he that hath received his witness hath set his seal to this, that God is true. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. No need of disputation as to whether Christ's baptism or John's purified from sin. It is the grace of Christ that gives life to the soul. Apart from Christ, baptism, like any other service, is a worthless form. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. The success of Christ's work, which the Baptist had received with such joy, was reported also to the authorities at Jerusalem. 
The priests and rabbis had been jealous of John's influence as they saw the people leaving the synagogues and flocking to the wilderness. But here was one who had still greater power to attract the multitudes. Those leaders in Israel were not willing to say with John, he must increase, but I must decrease. They arose with a new determination to put an end to the work that was drawing the people away from them. Jesus knew that they would spare no effort to create a division between his own disciples and those of John. He knew that the storm was gathering which would sweep away one of the greatest prophets ever given to the world. Wishing to avoid all occasion for misunderstanding or dissension, he quietly ceased his labors and withdrew to Galilee. We also, while loyal to truth, should try to avoid all that may lead to discord and misapprehension, for whenever these arise, they result in the loss of souls. Whenever circumstances occur that threaten to cause division, we should follow the example of Jesus and of John the Baptist. John had been called to lead out as a reformer. Because of this, his disciples were in danger of fixing their attention upon him, feeling that the success of the work depended upon his labors and losing sight of the fact that he was only an instrument through which God had wrought. But the work of John was not sufficient to lay the foundation of the Christian church. When he had fulfilled his mission, another work was to be done, which his testimony could not accomplish. His disciples did not understand this. When they saw Christ coming in to take the work, they were jealous and dissatisfied. The same dangers still exist. God calls a man to do a certain work, and when he has carried it as far as he is qualified to take it, the Lord brings in others to carry it still farther. But like John's disciples, many feel that the success of the work depends upon the first laborer. Attention is fixed upon the human instead of the divine. Jealousy comes in, and the work of God is marred. The one thus unduly honored is tempted to cherish self-confidence. He does not realize his dependence on God. The people are taught to rely on man for guidance, and thus they fall into error and are led away from God. The work of God is not to bear the image and superscription of man. From time to time, the Lord will bring in different agencies through whom his purpose can best be accomplished. Happy are they who are willing for self to be humbled, saying with John the Baptist, He must increase, but I must decrease. Join us next time as Nancy Hamilton Myers continues her dramatized audiobook, the Desire of Ages, written by Ellen G. White. This program has been brought to you by 3ABN Australia Radio.